Right, ladies and gentlemen, if you can take your seats, there are some more places just at the front here where I'm indicating, and we will get underway. Th this conference is focusing on the post-crisis agenda for the uh, centre-left, and uh, I'm pleased and relieved that we have uh, in countries uh, in Europe uh, progressive centre-left governments, leaders, prime ministers uh, who are taking on the responsibility of not just navigating their own countries uh, but Europe uh, as a whole uh, through uh, what are unprecedented stormy waters. Um, I'm relieved, we're relieved, I'm not quite sure if it feels quite the same from the individual leader's point of view uh, to be burdened with this responsibility uh, because it's tough, it's very difficult, uh, not just to make the choices, select the policies, uh, and satisfy themselves that they're the right ones, but they have to carry uh, a public uh, which in many cases uh, is very nervous, very insecure, and very fearful uh, for their own futures and those uh, of their children and families. Uh, as a result of uh, the policies that have to be taken on to deal with uh, what is a serious crisis. We are very uh, honored uh, this morning uh, to have with us uh, uh, those on the platform, Prime Ministers, Deputy Prime Minister, um, uh, to share with us uh, their own thoughts uh, and to open themselves to your questions uh, about uh, their approach in tackling uh, this difficult situation. Initially, I mean, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to make some introductory uh, remarks. But before they do that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Karen and Pascal uh, if they will help us frame uh, the discussion, frame the issues, frame the questions uh, uh, to help us uh, put in context uh, the discussion that we're going to have during the course of this uh, session. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Karen to go first to speak uh, for five, six, seven minutes, uh, no more. Uh, we've all, all of us accepted a uh, very firm, strict injunction on ourselves that we're going to operate and speak in a disciplined way so as to maximize time for everyone else. Um, but I'm going to kick off uh, by asking uh, Karen, the U.S. ambassador at the uh, OECD, uh, to make the first set of introductory remarks. Karen. Thank you very much. Um, I'm the U.S. ambassador to the OECD, but I also uh, had the uh, honor of working for President Obama before he was president in his Senate office and then writing the Democratic Party platform. So I hope when I'm uh, presenting you with these slides, because as U.S. ambassador to the OECD, it's as if I'm ambassador to data, uh, that you'll take the broader message, which is that it's possible for progressives uh, to win and also to govern on an economic message, even in economic hard times. But I think it's very difficult. And uh, what I'll try to run through is that it requires optimism, and as was discussed yesterday, owning the future. But first, the bad news. Um, just to give the context, this panel is uh, addressing jobs. <coughs> These are the unemployment numbers that you all know. Um, unemployment rates rem remain near historic highs of the crisis. In the U.S., we've had some good news. The last three months have been uh, better uh, numbers than we've seen in five years, but we still need a long way to go. But what I would argue is that, um, and this is just the U.S., I'll show you a broader cross-country comparison. If you just look at the jobs data, you're missing the story because the real um, backdrop to this is what's been happening to families and that in the post-war period, in the 25 years after the war, incomes doubled in the United States and in many of the other countries we're talking about. And there was a, an implicit deal in that, that if you worked hard, you could make it. And then growth uh, really slowed in the 70s, and it, was, it, was, uh, it seemed inexplicable. Uh, I was a management consultant at the time working with U.S. manufacturing companies and going to Midwestern towns where people were so puzzled and trying to figure out what to do. And then in the late 90s in the U.S., we had this uh, boom thanks to some very good policies. The Internet took off. 
companies started using it to improve their processes, productivity went up, jobs uh, increased, poverty went down, all good story, but then uh, after that, as John Podesta said yesterday, we had an experiment with uh, conservative uh, right-wing politics and policies, and uh, you see the, the slowing again, uh, and then you start to see a split between productivity increase and how actual families are doing. Then the crisis hit. Um, this is the comparable data across OECD countries. You see that on average, growth rates of 1.7% over the last 20 years, not really what people thought they were going to get, uh, not the deal that people were expecting. Um, so what I would argue is the first priority is really growth. And uh, it's more than stimulus plans. It's really getting at growth. I, I don't think anyone would argue that what we want to do is, uh, is just divide up a shrinking pie. What we want to do is grow the pie. And uh, this is just a chart talking about entrepreneurship. The president, President Obama, has convened actually a commission, Startup America, to make this point that what we're going to be about is growth. He's been talking about winning the future. Now even some conservatives in America have picked up the theme. The head of something called the George W. Bush Institute is now calling for the 4% solution, saying if we had 4% growth instead of what's uh, forecast, we could solve a lot of our, our deficit problems and also obviously people would be a lot happier. This is an incredibly hard message to sustain, obviously, in an era of deficits because the conversation, no matter how much President Obama wants to talk about winning the future, we have to talk about balancing the deficit. It's a very hard conversation to sustain, but it's very important to do so. What he's been talking about and what many others have been talking about is, um, is things like broadband, things like investing in green jobs, um, things like education. And uh, um, also we're talking about possibly corporate tax reform that will lower taxes and unleash growth um, by closing loopholes. And then I'm just gonna say one word, a plug for some of the international work that has to un underpin this, which is in the post-war period, we had a level playing field uh, that we worked very hard to build uh, rules of the road about how we didn't drive our ways into each other's markets with uh, export financing and so on. And it's very important that as we go forward, we uh, continue to engage uh, in all the multilateral organizations that we have and all the efforts that we have. So just at the OECD, for example, we're trying to uh, take what was the rich man's club and turn it into a global policy network. And so we've had some recent successes in terms of Russia signing the anti-bribery law, uh, new multinational enterprise guidelines that are how corporations should do business. Uh, we're working on uh, internet policy principles and so on. But let me just get quickly to the next theme, which is of course, as progressives, we don't just want growth if it means uh, continuing on with inequality. Um, that, you know, obviously, if only the rich are getting richer, then the growth isn't sufficient. You know the, uh, the inequality numbers, you, people talked about them yesterday. Something that I'd like to focus on though is, uh, is not just fairness, again, but opportunity. And these are social mobility numbers that are very troubling to us in the US because it says that a big predictor of how well someone does is how well their parents did, how wealthy their parents did. So there's this um, sense, again, that the deal that was struck, that if you work hard, you could make it, that maybe there's something wrong there, there's something broken in the system. So the United States, the UK, Italy, France, at least 40% of the economic advantage that high earning fathers have over low earning fathers is transmitted to their sons. Now obviously this is not the case in Nordic countries, Australia and Canada, but it's very troubling. Um, but we do have across countries obviously is this very high youth unemployment rate. And this again gets at this issue of opportunity, very important to stress. What do we do about opportunity? There are a number of things, obviously we don't have time to get into them. But wage supplements, we did a payroll tax cut. We have something called the Earned Income Tax Credit. Uh, training, especially for young people, and of course, bargaining rights. The third thing I'll just touch on is reform. Uh, we need to be about reforming government. We can't fall prey to uh, something that I call the progressive paradox, which is that even when people need government the most in an economic downturn, they become cynical and they don't trust government. And so progressives are in a box because they know that often uh, what the solutions are to be more proactive and yet people are very mistrustful. Sometimes they just want to get their money back in tax cuts. 
So showing that we're not just for government at all costs, we're for government that works, we're for programs that work, and uh, for getting savings. And I, I won't, we don't have time to go through these, but the OECD has calculated potential reforms from making education more efficient and healthcare more efficient, and you wind up seeing that you could save as much as two-thirds of our stimulus plan if you did sensible education reform and healthcare reform that made those sectors more efficient and, and actually serve people better. And then finally, what I'll conclude with is just family. Uh, I think progressives cede too often the family values debate to conservatives. And uh, we can't do that, especially as we're governing. It's uh, families really need someone who's speaking to them and the economic uh, uh, pressure that's being put on family well-being and also uh, stability. We all know that women have entered the workforce in the United States, we're at 50%. But I think what's important to know is they're doing it in large part because their families really need them to work. Uh, especially in the downturn, it's become incredibly important. New labor market data shows that it's very important to family uh, economic well-being to have women in the workplace. So we have to talk about the stresses, we have to talk about how important families are, how important <laughs> what parents do, what uh, children who are taking care of older parents is, uh, not just talk about uh, but uh, child care and paid leave and flexibility, all these things are very important as well. Uh, it's really going to be on Karen, value. Karen, one, just... Yeah, I'm go. done. I'm just going to say, uh, uh, the one other thing we have to talk about is local development. I think localism is incredibly important in a global economy. And I'll just uh, close by telling you that what we've been, what President Obama has been trying to do is tie all of this together in a values-based uh, framework and to say that um, uh, the economic choices you make are values choices. And so I'll just read you a quote where I think he did a great job very recently. He says, the America I know is generous and compassionate. It's a land of opportunity and optimism. Yes, we take responsibility for ourselves, but we also take responsibility for each other, for the country we want and the future w that we share. So I think that's the challenge is how do, we, uh, how do we do that as we govern and how do we communicate that that's what we're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Karen, very much indeed. Pascal, the Hercules of the WTO. <laughs> well, thanks, Peter. Uh, Karen has just uh, given us a sort of a macro uh, economic uh, framework for the discussion. And what I would like to do very briefly is uh, introduce this uh, important dimension, in my view, which is the one that relates to the politics of uh, this uh, macroeconomic globalization. <clears throat> During the crisis, we uh, all hoped uh, that this uh, major failure of uh, market capitalism as a system uh, would help convince uh, public opinion that uh, we were on the uh, right side of the argument. But this did not happen. After the crisis, if we are after the crisis, uh, we all uh, spent a lot of time uh, lamenting about why it didn't happen. Why is this uh, crisis uh, now lifting uh, right-wing parties more than uh, left-wing parties, uh, populism uh, more than social democracy? And the answer to this question, <clears throat> in my view, is quite simple. Uh, we got it wrong on globalization. We got it wrong on globalization uh, because we got it wrong on the analysis we made of globalization. Not the economic analysis, which in my view was uh, right, but on the politics of globalization. On the political consequences, uh, this huge transformation uh, has uh, on politics as it uh, reshuffles the relationship between states and markets, for sure, but probably more importantly, uh, as it uh, reshuffles the relationship of people to politics, to the police, to the city. Identity, uh, sense of uh, belonging, dreams, nightmares, 
uh, is uh, what shapes uh, political uh, attitude. At the end of the day, what Karen uh, just called uh, trust. And I think we have not yet seriously worked at uh, understanding how this unfolds, uh, hence how to relate uh, to uh, people's expectations. And for many of our supporters, the reality, the political reality, uh, remains that uh, globalization is uh, more of a challenge than an opportunity, more of a threat uh, than a hope. And I think to understand that, we just have to read this uh, very good book, even if I don't agree with everything which he has written by uh, Danny Roderick uh, on uh, the globalization uh, paradox. Now, what should we do? Uh, and that's my uh, contribution to introducing the discussion. Uh, I think we should work first on building a better narrative on uh, how to present globalization at home. Explain, uh, debate, uh, not leave this uh, ground uh, to the populace. And I believe this narrative uh, is not yet available. So we have to work uh, seriously on that. Second, uh, we need to build a convincing platform on how to harness the forces of globalization, how to increase uh, social justice and not uh, social injustice, how to make globalization uh, work for job creation, how to avoid globalization being uh, captured against uh, progressive taxation or union rights. A large part of this, of course, has to do with the domestic agenda, uh, and that's not my focus. Uh, another part of this has to do uh, with a proper international agenda, uh, which we should build and uh, promote uh, together uh, in the uh, various uh, fora of uh, what exists today of global governance. Now, what's this agenda? Very simply, uh, finance, climate, trade, currencies, taxation, migrations. Finance, because as we all know, we are now back to business as usual, uh, and we have not addressed, in my view, the inherent uh, fragilities of a global financial system. Climate, which is the new public good, which we had not in our sort of social democrat DNA. Trade, where we're at a time where short-sighted uh, mercantilist pressures uh, do obscure the larger challenge of the multilateral trading system, uh, which is one of the rare tools uh, available to uh, build a proper pro-development macroeconomy. And unfortunately, uh, as you know, uh, we now are stuck on this. Currencies, uh, because I do not believe uh, that what was uh, true at the time of uh, Bretton Woods uh, is not true today. On the contrary, we need more of an order in the international monetary system rather than less, which is what happened since the 70s. Taxation, where I believe we should be pretty clear that uh, competitive taxation is one of the differences between uh, right and left and migration which is fundamentally uh, an international issue uh, in order to avoid this uh, problem being captured again by populism. So in a nutshell, uh, my suggestion is that uh, uh, we should work on this narrative, we should work on this platform. Uh, we cannot do that alone. Uh, time is over where these issues uh, could be dealt with by the usual uh, white uh, social democrats. Uh, we need other forces, other partners uh, to build and to promote this agenda. And I think this is the priority I would uh, like to suggest. And if we need uh, 
one reference for a sort of a fair globalization where domestic agendas and international agendas are not separated anymore. Uh, let's just uh, look at uh, how they did it here in Norway. Uh, it's not just because of oil and fish that this country has been successful. Pascal, thank you very much indeed, and thank you and Karen for an excellent uh, scene uh, setting set of remarks from you both. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panel now to make some introductory remarks for the same uh, time period, uh, and I'm going to ask Ian St Stoltenberg to kick off. Thank you so much. First of all, let me thank you for sharing this panel, and also thank um, Pascal and Karen for their introductions. I will just as I say, uh, share with you some reflections and some remarks on the issues we are discussing uh, today and we discuss tomorrow or yesterday. And that is that, first of all, as I said yesterday, there are very many national differences. So it's always very demanding to sit in Oslo and to tell exactly what to do in the rest of the world. I have very precise ideas about what to do in Norway, but I'm more reluctant to have very strong ideas or or advises how to cope with big problems in the economy, in, in developing the welfare state in other European uh, countries. But having said that, I believe at least there are some general, uh, what should I say, aspects, uh, advice, which I think that we should try to uh, live up to. And one is that the core idea of uh, progressive policies or politics has been for many, many years to combine, to reconcile the need for social justice with the need for economic efficiency. And we have, in a way, always uh, contradicted the conservative idea uh, about that we have to choose between either efficiency or equity, either being social or efficient. We believe that actually a social society is also an efficient society, a fair society where we give everyone opportunity, is also very productive to society. So it's not a question of choosing between social justice or efficiency, economic growth. It's, it's how to combine uh, those two because they, when we do it right, stimulate each other. Uh, so what does this mean in praxis <coughs> in the aftermath of the uh, uh, financial crisis? Um, um, and, and again, just some uh, very few uh, uh, points. One is that um, we shall uh, uh, continue to support classical, uh, progressive, social democratic demand policy. Uh, I'm strongly in favor of contracycle policies. Uh, and uh, one of the, what should I say, very few uh, uh, beauties of the financial crisis is that suddenly everyone are in favor of demand policy. Uh, Keynes is reborn and uh, we, we, we support him, everyone. Also, those who have for many, many years uh, opposed the idea of uh, the government being responsible for regulating total demand through uh, fiscal policy are now strongly in favor of the government doing exactly that. So without stimulating the demand during the financial crisis, increasing public expenditures, the crisis would have been much more severe. So we should continue with demand management uh, in the classical way. But the challenge is that it's very easy to get support for increasing public expenditures during times of recessions. But it's very uh, uh, demanding to get support for uh, keeping back reducing public expenditures during uptown, or upturns or, or, or when the economy grows. So the challenge is that if you are in favor of contracycle policies, we have to be, to, to, to be that in a symmetric way, both when we have to increase demand, but also when we have to decrease demand. And it is the last thing that is the difficult thing. We are presenting our reviewed budget, uh, revised budget today in Norway. And uh, there we are actually decreasing uh, the, the, ex uh, the, the fiscal stimulus from the national budget, uh, exactly because now we see growth again. So if we're going to spend much money, next time the, we face downturns, we have to 
spend less now, and it has to be uh, symmetric, and I think that's one of the uh, lessons, is that too many countries spend too much money, both on public expenditures and on tax deductions, when we had strong growth some years ago, so they hadn't enough uh, reserves to, 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 to implement contra-cycle policies during uh, the recession or the financial crisis. The other thing, which I also mentioned during our meeting yesterday, is that we cannot only focus on the demand side of the economy. We have to focus also on the supply side. And that's not a conservative message, it's a progressive message. But we have another idea of what is supply side uh, uh, measures or supply side economies than uh, conservative forces. One key issue is, for instance, labor market measures. Uh, to keep up the skills, uh, labor market training programs, uh, especially target on uh, young people, immigrants, those who have weak ties to the labor market, it's extremely important and perhaps the most efficient supply side measure we can do uh, to make our, or to increase the growth capacity of our economies. And, uh, and just to underline that, uh, and that is that the thing that actually worries most is the, uh, is the danger that the unemployment now can remain at high levels. And we have a long experience that it's not a symmetric movement uh, when uh, the economy goes down, the unemployment goes up, but when the economy starts to grow again, the unemployment tends to stick to remain at high levels. Labor market measures is perhaps the most targeted thing we can do to mobilize, to help people back into uh, the labor force. Then family policy. It's not perhaps the most classical supply side measure you can think of, but again, I think the, the message, the, 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 the lesson from the Nordic countries is that when we have invested in kindergartens, in, in paternal leave, and in, 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 in after-school clubs and so on, that's good for the families. It's, it, it's good for equal rights between men and women. But it is perhaps, at least in Norway, the most, what should I say, profitable uh, 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 investments we have made. Because the increase in female work participation has really been one of the key uh, explanations for the strong economic growth and the increased growth capacity in the Norwegian and, and, and the Nordic economies. So, so uh, to stimulate uh, women to work, to, to, to integrate more people, is a classical, into the labor market, is a classical example of how we combine economic growth with social justice uh, 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 fairness. I'll just end by saying one more thing, and that is that I think also we learned during the financial crisis that we need better regulations. That not, not, do not necessarily mean more regulations, but better regulations, both on the national level, but also on the international level, and we have to uh, strengthen international institutions, like the IMF, uh, and to have cross-border uh, institutions to stabilize also the international uh, economy. Thank you. Jens, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And I'm sure there'll be areas of your Keynesian plus approach that we will want to come back to uh, and probe. Um, George, how, how is the uh, world from Athens? From Athens, well, um, whenever I come to Norway, and Jens, thank you uh, for this invitation and uh, hosting this <coughs> event. Uh, it reminds me, of course, that when I was a young boy, I was here with my family as a refugee and uh, the, uh, uh, my father even had a Norwegian passport uh, because he could not get a Greek passport. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is an area of refuge. But uh, uh, it is also, I think, at a time when we should not kid ourselves, there is really no area of refuge in our world. Our, we're, our problems are so intertwined, are so interdependent, uh, that uh, we all have to work together. And I think this is the message I would like to bring from Greece, where <clears throat> the Greek drama actually has become a European drama. And uh, we are dealing with this, uh, and uh, it could be a more widespread, if you like. I think it's testing, and I'd like to say a few words on Europe uh, and, and what a progressive Europe could and should be. 
Uh, it's testing, really, the um, political will and the cohesion of Europe. Uh, it's testing our institutional capabilities. It's testing our European identity. It's testing concepts such as growth, competitiveness, solidarity. It's testing our overall capacity to deal with the global crisis of the day in an effective way. And this may not sound scientific, but I would like to uh, differentiate progressive with conservative, where I see conservative in Europe today, and maybe not only in Europe, as uh, the politics of fear, um, an underlying pessimism concerning our society's capabilities, while I think we represent the politics of hope, uh, underlying a belief in the empowerment of our societies and what we can do and what we can do together. I'd make five points of this drama, if you like, and some of the contradictions we have been dealing with. We were faced with a, and are still faced with a huge debt and deficit, which I think very rightly we do not think that is progressive, to have a huge debt and deficit. And that's what I think Jens also pointed to, is uh, we can be both efficient and equitable at the same time. It's a huge burden, and on the one hand, we've had success by cutting the budget by 5% in one year, uh, reforming our pension system in this last year and making it viable, reforming our tax system to make it more equitable, opening up professions in Greece, consolidating local government, making things transparent in Greece. Everything is online. Every euro that is spent is online. Meritocracy in the civil service. And we have some initial positive results, a 40% increase in our exports. Tourism seems to be doing well this year. Our agricultural sector is going up. We are moving to subsidize jobs. We are moving into a green economy, investing in a green economy. And even the IMF today is saying that um, our debt is sustainable. Uh, we can manage our debt without restructuring. However, on the other hand, markets are pounding us incessantly. Media are predicting a doomsday, and, and this is promoting a culture of fear. The pain taken by our citizens and by our youth, the sacrifices seem not enough to let up the situation and give us a breathing space. So that's the first part of the drama after a year of work. A second part of the drama is the systemic contradiction in the European Union. We have created a monetary union, but we're halfway there. We have decided we will defend the euro. We have, Greece has decided, and the Europeans uh, in the Eurozone have decided, Greece will remain in the euro. There's no going back in Europe. Yet we're not moving forward enough either. So we're somewhere stuck in the middle. Even though we've created a new mechanism uh, for uh, dealing with problems, whether it's in Greece or Ireland or Portugal, uh, we should move forward, such as what many of the socialists, the socialists have propo proposed and, and others, and uh, uh, my dear friend Paul here has been fighting for this, uh, the common European bond, for example, which would be a, uh, a conclusive step to dealing with the debt management problem. So I would see um, here, again, progressive politics could be a positive response to the crisis, an effective response to the crisis. Third point, Europe today is more than ever a potential answer to our globalized problems. Not only a peace project, which it has been traditionally between the East and the West, uh, the Balkans, the issue of Cyprus and so on, but also a, a, a par paradigm for where sovereign states of different cultures can share sovereignty to deal with common problems and deal with them effectively, but also deal with them on the basis of values, democracy, rule of law, free trade, but also social, co social cohesion. Yet today in Europe, we see more than ever, more than ever before, I believe, instead of really coordinating our responses, a common response to so many of the global crises, uh, from unemployment to migration to environment and, of course, finance, we are becoming ethnophobic xenophobic, we're looking for scapegoats, we're playing a blame game. Uh, we are saying, oh, it's the North that's being to be, to be blamed, or it's the periphery to be blamed, uh, or the migrants to be blamed. Obviously, this is incapacitating Europe. It is 
losing the potential we really have. And that brings me to the fourth point where uh, we face a particular drama in the region, in Greece. Greece, uh, even though we are in the midst of a financial crisis, turmoil if you like, um, we also remain a frontline state of stability for Europe and for the region. Greece remains key for the stability in the Balkans, key in the relationship with uh, Turkey and the solution to Cyprus, key in the uh, region where, which is going through a turmoil, a democratic revolution, but also other problems such as in Libya, where we have taken even initiative to see if we can find a diplomatic solution to this problem. Uh, and Greece also happens to be, not only for the West, but even for these movements, a symbol of democracy. And uh, I usually say that uh, we should not identify democracy with the West as, uh, or with a Christian Europe, as sometimes conservatives do. Uh, democracy was founded uh, in a country which, or <coughs> polis, or city, which had 12 gods, not one, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, was uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean. But this just shows the potential that Europe has in the region, which it's not using uh, if we had common policies to create peace, new relations with the Arab world, uh, and, and, of course, greater stability. Finally, uh, growth and competitiveness uh, part of the drama. EU could make, the European Union could make this financial crisis a time for, as Jens said, better regulation, not more, but better regulation. Also dealing with the environment, dealing with um, the energy crisis, the food crisis, the regional revolutions, uh, the question of migration and so on. These could be opportunities, opportunities for a new model of growth. I would like to call it green growth. Uh, investing in infrastructure, investing in green agriculture, investing in education for uh, the new type of this green economy, investing in the energy networks, investing in connecting uh, the European Union into a single market through the internet and social media, investing in our capacity uh, to grow, uh, to be competitive, make us competitive, and bring jobs, jobs for our youth and jobs for our society. So we would see competitiveness not, not as simply uh, dealing with our debt and, and deficits and, and simply austerity at the, at the national level, but as a European project where we invest uh, and create growth. So I would like to conclude simply by saying Europe has potential, great potential. Uh, I believe it's wasting its potential at this point, allowing for the world to become more unjust because Europe is playing and can play an even further global role. More inequitable world, less secure world, uh, unluckily more nationalistic, greater concentration of power, obviously more unemployment. And this will only lead to the erosion of our democratic values and institutions and the frustration of our societies. So our challenge, I believe, is that either we humanize globalization or we will be moving more towards extremism, populism, and violence, and, and frustration. And this is where I think we progressives uh, symbolize the hope that we can and will humanize globalization and do this, so, do this in Europe, obviously. Thank you very much. Very good. George, thank you very much indeed for those remarks. I mean, not just for your leadership in, in Greece, but uh, what you've said about Europe, which I think we need to come back to. I'm going to uh, ask um, the president of Serbia, Boris Tadjic, who is a sort of the, the newcomer uh, into the European fold uh, uh, to speak next. And it's great to have you on this uh, panel, Boris. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm really glad to have opportunity to, to present some view from the country like Serbia. In my view, the situation is uh, very similar in other countries on the Western Balkans, the countries that are not uh, integrated in Europe, European Union today. Uh, Serbia is a country with a seven half million people, inhabitants, and uh, our GDP per capita is of 4,000 euros. It's very low. Uh, average wage is uh, 350 euros. Average pension is uh, 200 euros. 
unemployment rate is at 20%. And absolute poverty rate is uh, more than 9%. Serbia is a country affected because of war that happened in the 1990s. Situation in other countries in the region is even worse. Expectations are very high because of having many opportunities before war in the former Yugoslavia. And people are remembering what happened and how many chances we had uh, 20 years ago. They're impatient. They need uh, more jobs and a real perspective. In that respect, I don't see alternative than European Union integrations. At the same time, we know very well that we cannot bring uh, new conflicts in European Union, our poverty and our problems. Before joining, we have to solve our challenges. How to do that in atmosphere of economic crisis? It's a very important question. Especially having in mind that Serbia, for example, had a huge growth after democratic changes in October the 5th, 2000, until the crisis, between seven and six and seven percent per year. Unemployment rate was uh, 14 percent in 2008. Average salary in Serbia has been uh, 460 euros, which means that we are affected because of crisis. That's the best possible atmosphere for populists. That is the best possible atmosphere for nationalists. Having in mind uh, that we are vulnerable societies, we have to be focused on the uh, main challenges. <coughs> in my view, this is not only reconciliation. We are doing a lot in that respect. This is not only implementing reforms. Yes, it is, but we have to be focused on priority. This is creating new jobs. Right now, we are affected because of unemployment. That is becoming a critically important issue for Serbia and other regional countries. What is the good news? We are bringing discipline in our state policy, even though we are very much affected. Our public debt is 43% of our GDP. Uh, we are not earning more money than, we are not spending more money than we are earning. Uh, we are cutting expenditures. But at the same time, we are asking ourselves how to create new jobs. We have to invest in the economy. It's the state that has to invest in the economy. If we don't have a foreign investors. Take into account the fact that before crisis that was a 1.7 trillion euros foreign investments globally thinking. And right now we have a 700 billion euros altogether investments in a global economy. The competition for foreign investors is uh, very strong. And who is going to be affected? Vulnerable economies like Serbia, like Western Balkan countries. What I have to add to that issue, that we are also affected because of crisis in the North Africa. We had a, traditionally speaking many, many workers that has been working in that kind of countries, like <coughs> Libya, for example. And because of war, they lost their jobs. They turned back in Serbia. What about our investment in that kind of countries today? 
anyway, we are focused on solving main problems. At the same time, we are participating in many, many other fields. This is finishing cooperation with the ICTI, arresting last two in the ITs like Kratko Mladic and Koran Hadjic and sending them in the Hague Tribunal. Reconciliation process, fighting organized crime, in which we are contributing to the European Union uh, economies. They are going to be more affected than, than Serbia and other countries because of end users of the uh, activities of uh, traffickers and the criminals are in, in the richer countries, like European Union countries. We are building right now infrastructure. We are trying to connect European Union countries that are on the northern border of Serbia and the southern border of Serbia by building infrastructural projects. We are working very hard on administration capacities in my country. We're implementing laws. We are fulfilling our obligations regarding reaching candidate status in European Union. But at the same time, we are affected because of unemployment. Unemployment is a huge problem for my country. <coughs> and we cannot solve that alone. <coughs> we need understanding. The situation is uh, very fragile. And you can see demonstrations all around the, the Balkans. You can see more tensions. But I don't see alternative then. European Union integrations, implementing reforms, fighting organized crime, and uh, to be more innovative in creating new jobs. What we are doing right now in that respect, in creating new jobs, we are reducing taxes for medium and small size enterprises. I hope that is going to create atmosphere much better in creating new jobs. We are investing in uh, building infrastructure. We are, inve we are going to invest in the public work. We are taking into account how to do something for females right now, as Jens has been explaining clearly. But we have to take into the consideration that Two parts of our population are very much affected. Young people and the people that lost a job, that are 50 years old, even more, and they don't have a perspective regarding current situation we are facing with. For those social groups, we have to do something right now. Otherwise, we'll be in a very difficult situation, having in mind the structure of our population. Young people has to have perspective, and older people has to have a social security atmosphere. That is what we are doing right now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed. And our last speaker on the panel, before we open it up, uh, uh, Eamon Gilmore, the uh, Labour Deputy Prime Minister in the new uh, uh, administration. Uh, in Britain, there's been some experience of coalition partners uh, taking on responsibility, uh, but not total control of the political situation in which they find themselves. Um, Tell us about the, um, the first few months. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, it's actually just been two months. Um, it feels emotionally a little longer than that. Um, but uh, it's, it's been a coalition, as you said. It's a coalition government um, just elected. Um, uh, the largest party in the coalition is Fine Gael, which is the affiliate party of the European People's Party. And uh, the second party is the second largest party in the state, the 
uh, the Labour Party, which I have the, the privilege to lead. And we have come into government at a time of great economic crisis, which is characterised by, first of all, the failure in the, the banking system, uh, very big fiscal deficit, high level of unemployment, about 14.5% right now. And we have inherited the um, framework which was put in place by the previous government, the programme that they agreed with the EU, the ECB and the IMF. And in those very limited uh, circumstances, uh, we've had, we, we have to address the issue of how do we uh, create jobs and how do we uh, grow the economy. And the approach that we have taken is, first of all, to be decisive. Um, I was struck by what Karen said earlier about the progressive paradox that at the very time when uh, people need government uh, to be effective, there is this lack of confidence or loss of confidence in politics and in government. And we've been hugely conscious that the new government was elected uh, with a very large turnout at a general election and with a very large majority. And therefore, it is critically important that the public see that that government is addressing issues straight up. So straight away, we have addressed the banking issue. We had the results of very strenuous stress tests for our banks. And we decided uh, straight away to make decisions about the future shape of uh, Irish banking so that there would be certainty uh, about that, that we would proceed with reforms of the banking uh, system and that hopefully that that would release uh, credit, uh, per particularly to small and medium-sized uh, businesses. Secondly, we have decided that we would put jobs and growth at the centre of our economic strategy. And this week, we announced a jobs initiative or a jobs budget, which is not intended to be a major stimulus uh, uh, package, but more a confidence-building measure. And we've concentrated on those areas where we can get relatively quick wins. What sectors of the economy can we stimulate right now that will generate employment uh, in the short to medium term? And we've looked at uh, tax changes which will uh, encourage activity in the tourism uh, industry. And we've looked at areas where in infrastructure development by shifting resources uh, to more labor intensive uh, activity in road building, uh, school building, uh, and so on. And thirdly, in labor activation measures. Uh, education, uh, training, measures which will uh, get people into useful activity uh, while they're uh, unemployed. The third part of our strategy is to build on the strengths because we do have strengths. We're a strong exporting economy uh, and our exports are, uh, are growing. Uh, so our focus is to look at where we can expand trade. We export 80% of what we produce, yet only 2% of our exports are to China. Uh, less than 1% uh, to India. So one of the uh, areas that we're looking to is how we expand trade and how we grow uh, our um, export, um, uh, our, our, uh, our export economy. The fourth area is to look at what George talked about, the, the new models of, uh, new models of growth, um, particular investing in, uh, in people. As I mentioned earlier, in our jobs initiative, we have concentrated on uh, education and training program. Uh, we have uh, a particular emphasis in terms of our investment on research and uh, in innovation, uh, on looking at the knowledge economy, not just as what we do in the high-tech area, an area where we have uh, considerable strengths, but also how the knowledge economy uh, is an economy that is, is applied to the entire uh, area of economic activity, activity, how you apply knowledge to uh, the wider economy, and of course, looking to the green economy areas such as the potential that we have uh, for development in alternative energies. The fifth part of our strategy is, the, uh, is, is reform. Uh, I think to some extent, I think progressives, while we, we talk about change, we want change, we often find ourselves, I think, as the defenders of the, of the status quo. And uh, we have set out a reform program which is across uh, a number of areas, reform of corporate governance. Let's not forget that the economic crisis is principally a crisis uh, that emerged from the private sector and there is a need for reform of corporate governance, reform of uh, banking and financial institution uh, regulation, certainly clearly a need for reform 
of uh, public services and public administration, reform of politics itself, and, the, and reforms that bring about fairness uh, in both uh, the distribution uh, of income and the availability of, uh, of opportunity. In the circumstances that we find ourselves where we're dealing with an immediate economic uh, crisis and people understand uh, what, what the, the, the nature of that crisis, and in circumstances where um, for the next couple of years we are likely to be, be in, in a position where the, the changes and the decisions that we have to make are going to be difficult and are, in many cases are going to be unpopular. What we have to do is we have to focus on the future and give a sense of what it is we are trying uh, to build. And I think that that is probably uh, the area that we need to, to discuss, that we need to have a sense of the future. We need to be able to paint a picture of what the future is going to be like. We need to be, if you like, the political movement of, uh, of the future. And in, in addressing that, I, I, I sum it up in, in what I call the SOS message. Uh, uh, S, first of all, for security. Uh, security in terms of what happens if things go wrong? What happens if you lose your job? What is the pension going to be like when you grow old? What is the health service going to be like? Because I think that is one of the critical things that uh, people look to us for, and particularly look to the progressive political movement to address, is to provide the, the uh, security that we have traditionally provided through the, through the welfare state, but which we need to provide into the future by a reformed uh, welfare state. So S for security. O for opportunity, because we, I think, again, have to look at where the economic opportunities are, where the opportunities for growth are, and how we translate that to ensuring that individuals and families and households uh, and businesses have opportunities themselves and can see, uh, see the progressive political movement as uh, providing the political leadership, which is about uh, opportunity. And S, then, for sustainability, because we have to, uh, I think the big lesson of the economic crisis that we have uh, suffered from is that we build uh, an economic model that is itself sustainable, but that is also located uh, in a context of uh, environmental uh, and social uh, sustainability uh, as well. So we are going through, um, Peter, a period of a difficult, challenging um, uh, period, one that we are confident that we will come through. I agree with George that uh, this has to be done in a European context, and I think that there are uh, a lessons, lessons that uh, Europe needs to learn at an institutional level uh, and at a regulatory uh, level. But I think that there is, also, uh, an there is also a call now too, I think also, on the solidarity on which uh, the European Union and European institutions uh, were, were built, that those uh, countries which are challenged at the present, which have difficult um, economic um, crises to, uh, to overcome, uh, that European solidarity is a very important element uh, in enabling us and in assisting us uh, to do that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. <laughs> Eamon, thank you very much indeed. And I think uh, some of those present might want to come back and uh, probe on your program of security, opportunity, and sustainability. I'd like to kick off the questions, uh, though, by just taking up the, the last point you made, if I may, Eamon, and put it back uh, to George uh, and to you uh, about the role of, of Europe, of the European Union, its institutions, and the ECB uh, in helping you face up to the challenges uh, that you do. I think I'm right in thinking that your party has in the past been slightly critical uh, of um, uh, the uh, uh, terms and conditions on which uh, European institutions have, uh, have put to you. And George, you said uh, that you felt that there was a potential for Europe to do slightly differently uh, and better uh, in helping you meet this uh, crisis. Now, obviously we, we want Europe and its institutions to uh, perform in the most optimal way. We certainly don't want an anti-European backlash um, uh, um, uh, emerging in either of your countries or elsewhere. C can you both of you just say a little bit more about 
how you think, both through solidarity and self-interest, Europe could do a bit differently and a bit better. George? Well, I think the point is that, from our point of view, is that we have been uh, doing our homework uh, in, in making the changes in Greece uh, for debt sustainability and deficit reduction. Uh, but at the same time, we are in a... Uh, in, a, in an incomplete monetary union, or an incomplete economic union, if you like, which uh, does not have all the tools to deal with uh, the wider issues, uh, the most simple one which now every Greek uh, understands is the one of spreads, that uh, when we go onto the market to borrow, our, our borrowing interest is, is way beyond that of the average, and certainly further beyond that of, let's say, Germany or some of the more competitive countries. That is not sustainable in a monetary union. And that one of the reasons why we had to go to this mechanism is that we couldn't really tap the market in a viable way. But there are solutions to this. And, and as I said, uh, one of the solutions that have been come, has come up, and the European Parliament has, has, has in, in its uh, uh, majority has supported this is the euro bond. There are other uh, possible solutions uh, to the growth potential and where do we get the revenue, for example, again, the euro bonds to leverage, to leverage uh, investment, uh, but also the so-called financial transaction tax, which um, would be a way. We have a debate in Europe about shouldn't the private sector pay for some of its sins and um, the way we have created the mechanism, we have put the burden on the private sector if there is a future default in some country, but this makes the risk for private investment even higher and it has had a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of pressuring Ireland and, and Portugal and Greece and the bond markets, but we could have a financial transaction tax where we actually say, you, yes, you must pay for growth and development and use this for, for investment. Uh, the migration problem, we really don't have a common migration policy. Greece right now has uh, approximately 90% of all illegal migration comes to Greek borders and we have to deal with it. It's a huge problem. This is not a Greek problem, this is a, a European problem. Uh, these are problems that if we do not deal with collectively, then they become uh, nasty uh, debates amongst ourselves, who is to blame and how, why aren't you doing what you should do and so on. Uh, if we do deal with them collectively, uh, I, can, I can assure you, and for example, in the financial issue, uh, in talking to the most, if you like, um, uh, cynical hedge fund uh, or, or bankers and so on, they say, yes, a European bond would calm the markets and you would solve it and you wouldn't have this fighting between countries, why am I paying for the Greeks or why am I paying for the Irish and so on. So um, it's not that simple, obviously, but I'm just saying that there is a potential, and this is where I think a progressive uh, Europe can really make a difference. Thank you very much. Amy? The Irish experience of membership of the European Union has been a very positive one. Uh, access to a market of uh, 500 uh, uh, million people. Uh, we've benefited over the years from uh, a huge amount of financial support from the European Union, which helped uh, the Irish economy to uh, to, to, to grow. Um, our membership of the Euro has, by and large, been a positive, uh, by positive one. I recall the difficulties uh, that we had in the early 1990s, for example, when uh, our currency was being uh, speculated against, and that had a hugely stabilizing effect. Uh, I think that the uh, cheap money, if you like, the, the uh, lower interest uh, rates that applied in the, in the Euro area, um, um, was a factor in the growth of the property bubble in, in Ireland. But it would be wrong to, to blame it on the, uh, on the euro. Uh, the reason that the property bubble uh, created a problem for the Irish economy uh, wasn't because of the existence of the euro, it was because of the pursuit of wrong uh, domestic policies uh, by the previous government, which tax incentivized uh, property, uh, pr property activity. So there's no point in blaming uh, what happened uh, in our domestic economy on the, uh, on the, the existence of the, uh, of the euro. Uh, I think also that the, you know, the support that has been available in recent times 
uh, from the ECB. Uh, it's hugely, hugely important to us. The one area where we have some difficulty at the moment is on the interest rate uh, on the finance that we're getting. And uh, to date, uh, the reduction in that interest rate, which was agreed in principle at the European Council in March, has not been extended to us because it seems to me that some member states uh, have, uh, uh, you know, are, are, are blocking it for, uh, for, uh, for a number of reasons. Now, I don't think that that position is sustainable uh, into the future because a country that is complying with the terms of the programme uh, that, that was agreed, uh, that is going to return to growth this year uh, after three years of, uh, of recession, uh, I don't think that it is sustainable or, or fair that that uh, reduction in the interest rate, which had been agreed, uh, would continue to be uh, withheld uh, from us. That's at one level. At, at a, a more general uh, level, uh, yes, I think we do have to, and as, uh, as a movement, I think we do have to address the measures that can be agreed uh, collectively at a European, uh, at a European Union uh, level, uh, because this is not just an economic crisis that applies to individual states, it is also a European, uh, a, European, uh, a European crisis. And I think that collectively we do have to work on what kind of measures can be agreed at a European level to help uh, get us through that. Thank you. George? Just on that, because I wanted to agree with Stephen on that other side of the Euro, that Euro did give us greater potential to borrow uh, in countries that were maybe less competitive, to borrow and, uh, and uh, do so with quite a large amounts and borrow cheaply. Uh, and um, this is where uh, the previous government in Greece uh, had, uh, it's not the question, as, as Eamon said, is whether you can do this, is how you use that money then, if you use it productively or if you use it uh, in a way which creates a bubble. In the, in the case of Greece, it was a, 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 a bubble in the, in the public sector uh, uh, with, with policies which were not transparent and, and very clientelistic and so on and so forth, and that's what we're paying for, a debt that almost doubled in the past five and a half, six years. Uh, and this is why, of course, the euro needs uh, both the um, solidarity, but it also needs the strict uh, controls that we are putting into place to make sure that countries do follow uh, a, a more efficient uh, management of their debt and deficit. So that's the other side of the story. And I think we need to, as progressives, to th see both sides of the story uh, in a way which is, which is realistic. Yes, we do need, do need the solidarity, but we also need the responsibility. I think this is the two sides of the story. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to just invite some indications uh, of those who want to uh, uh, come in. Uh, okay, I've got three. Boris, can I just, though, just before we leave the European theme, just very quickly, could you just say how Serbia is advancing in its own European aspiration and uh, towards the European Union? Uh, and whether you think that, I mean, I know it's a very sort of emotional issue for many of your voters. It's also sensitive in, uh, in the European uh, Union. Uh, how the position of Kosovo is being properly parked uh, in this advance of your own country towards membership of the European Union? First of all, to turn back a little bit on the issue of Euro and European economy. We are dependent on European economy. Our exports is going mainly on European Union markets. And everything that's going on in European Union is a making huge impact on economic situation in Serbia and other Western Balkan countries. Uh, the good thing is that we have an increasing of our export more than 20% this year. And uh, we are going to have, a, I mean, growth for 3% this year. That is going to create uh, some uh, good elements in our economy and in a social atmosphere. But at the same time, we are facing with other difficulties. Uh, you mentioned one of them. This is a dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade and the situation on Kosovo. It's one of the most difficult issues for Serbia and Serbian people. Uh, what is, in general, my idea is to, solve, to try to solve conflicts. In the atmosphere of conflicts, we cannot have improvement. If we don't have improvement of economy, investments and uh, we don't have a social justice uh, society. 
And if we don't have a society that is oriented towards creation, jo social justice, we don't have a real perspective. Uh, in creating that societies, we are going to be closer to the membership of European Union. And from that reason, we are working on more fields. Dialogue with Kosovo, solving problem in Bosnia, trying to be helpful in solving other conflicts in the region, be very careful in commenting situation in other countries, for example, in Croatia, hoping that Croatia is going to join as soon as possible in the European Union, and after that, uh, Serbia and other countries, and uh, that is going to create a better perspective. But European Union has to understand, I mean, I'm talking about institutions and politicians, that without integration of the Western Balkans, on the end, at the end of the day, uh, the price is going to be higher. And European Union has to take into the consideration the fact that Western Balkans is European soil, Second, everything what's going on on the Western Balkans has an impact on European Union economy. And solving and preventing problems on the Western Balkans is the best possible investment in the future. Not only for us, but also for European Union countries. And that is why we are participating in all, in all those processes by defending our legitimate national interests, but also taking into the consideration that we have a common future in Europe. Thanks very much. Now I'm going to go to Maria first and then uh, come down here and then to there and then to there. Okay, so Maria first. Just say who you are for everyone as well, each person who asks a question. Yes. Um, good morning. Uh, Maria Rodriguez, uh, working with the Party of European Socialists. About the Eurozone crisis, I think that we progressives, we should be clear that the only way to overcome this problem is to ask a big effort from the vulnerable countries, but also to ask a general effort from the European Union and the Eurozone. And what is missing, it seems to me, is a fair deal to make sure that we have a Eurozone sustainable on the long term. And in order to have this deal, I think we have three very simple ideas. One is to make sure that we have fiscal discipline with the last resort solidarity. But I mean really solidarity, not the kind of solidarity which is uh, including the possibility of default, which I believe would be a disaster. Second, to make sure that we reform the financial system in order to ensure more responsible lending and borrowing. And third, a real coordination for growth. And this means not only reforms, but an investment agenda. So it seems to me that we progressives, we could play a role over the next months, which will be critical to overcome this Eurozone crisis, in order to come up with this new and fair deal for the Eurozone. I believe it's easier for us in our political family to achieve this kind of deal. Thank you very much. Uh, just at the front here. I'm going to ask members of the panel to come back a bit later and comment on these uh, points just here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sony Kapoor, running Redefine, and we advise EU policymakers and finance. Did you say who you were? On, uh, Sony Kapoor, and I run a think tank called Redefine. Uh, on the Euro crisis, it has been very depressing in Brussels to see every single point in time, at every fork in the road, obfuscation rather than decisiveness, pushing the problem further down. And we have, on paper, put a lot of money forward. We have put a lot of steps. And one year from now, if you went to Mars in April last year and came back, on paper it looks very good. But actually, the situation is much worse. And the only thing that actually explains that is the process of getting here, which has been so fraught that by getting to this point, in getting to this point, we have exposed political rifts 
indecisiveness, often levels of incompetence to such an extent that it is clear for everybody to see that when Europe says we will do whatever it takes, it is we will do whatever it takes subjects to this, 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 and this constraint. So we have a very large uncertainty overhang for which Greece is paying a price, Ireland, but not just you, but the whole of Europe is paying a price. Sovereign spreads, bank spreads, private investment are all depressed. And I would ask you that given that progressives are not in power in the EU and that we are not going to get a better process of decision making and more money is actually not going to solve the problem, neither for Greece nor for you, would Ireland and Greece then take the right steps in, resort, in resolving the uh, uncertainty by actually having a fairer burden sharing and saying tomorrow is better and different than today and restructuring some of the debts because okay. it's not going to happen at the European level. Okay, thank you very much. We can come back to that. Let's go over here now to the lady just there. Andrea Westall, consultant in the UK. Um, I just want to pick up something that, that Pascal and George mentioned because it, it, it kind of gets mentioned and then gets lost a lot in all these discussions. Pascal, you talked about the, the negative um, effects of identity, belonging, trust that people are feeling. George, about the need to humanise globalisation. Now, in a way, this, we can't just sort of say this is a crisis issue. This happened and has been happening for a long time. It's the effects of growth and change. At the Social Policy um, Policy Network event about a month ago, we talked again more about social ills more widely, sometimes the negative impacts of social mobility. They're not always positive. Isolation, mental health. So I think that we need to go way beyond narrative and even beyond the kind of things... In the UK, we're very bad at it, but social partnership, dialogue, I know has been important recently. But I think we possibly need to go a lot further now. We're going to have a lot of transitions, positive and negative impacts on people. We've got complex, diverse issues to deal with in the economy. And in order to deal with climate change, we're going to have to go very fast. And do we have the right partnerships, the right approaches to do that and have inclusive growth? So what we've mentioned so far here has been economic democracy only in the workplace. That's probably not enough. Welfare state for security, again, not enough. The question for the panel is, do we not need to think about... Um, issues of spaces, forums, partnerships, roles to the state that are kind of spread across sectors, they're spread across local areas, cross EU, different ways of dealing with innovation, growth, and possibly also even institutions that enable people to actually have identity, respect within the transitions and the resilience needed as we go forward. Okay. Do you want to respond to that? Yes, or a little bit later. Yeah. Or don't say so much. Yeah, yeah, just just respond to that point. I just want to take that up, if I may. First of all, I believe very much that the idea of social mobility is the key issue because it is actually in the core of what I was talking about in the beginning and, uh, and what you mentioned now, and, uh, and that is that social mo mobility is both a question of uh, fairness, social justice, but it's also a question of mobilizing uh, the potential of the people in a country. So it's just a very good example of that there's no contradiction between efficiency and fairness. It works uh, uh, together. And of course, the, uh, uh, the, the big danger now is that uh, unemployment, uh, the, the big economic problems we are seeing, will uh, decrease the possibility of social mobility and will uh, uh, actually set the whole development backwards. And that's one of the reasons I believe that we should focus on what's going on in the labor market, both in the short term, but also more structural reforms related to, for instance, uh, uh, welfare schemes, pension schemes. And uh, it's difficult, it's, it's hard to see exactly how to do it, but the whole idea of combining some kind of uh, demand for activity, education, some work, work for, to, to make people more active instead of being just passive recipients of uh, welfare and, and, and benefits is, a, is a, again a way of combining uh, social fairness with, with a more uh, growth-oriented policy. Thank you. Um, gentlemen here, Any, can I just see where we are? Yeah, okay, I've got that. You first. Yeah, my name is 
Lou Rothstein. I'm head of the Quality of Government Institute, which is a research institute at the uh, University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Two years ago, we were asked by the European Commission's Directorate for Regional Development to do a study of the quality of government in European countries. And this report is just finished. It's based on 34,000 interviews with citizens in Europe about how they perceive and their experience of quality of government. That is how they perceive corruption, fairness, legality, impartiality, and so on. And uh, the news is that there is huge variation. And two of the countries that score worst is Greece and Serbia. Uh, people perceive corruption, people perceive unfairness, people perceive that you cannot trust the government institutions. And uh, I'm absolutely convinced that if you don't get these institutions to work properly, properly, you will not have economic investment, but people will also refrain from paying taxes and trust the state with social services. So my question to you is, what is your strategy for doing something with this problem? Okay, let's just have a quick response, if we may, to that question before we move on. First from George and then from Boris. Well, I would, I would agree with you. I think that's the key to the uh, problem. I've always said this is, the economic question is the, is the symptom. The debt and the deficit is the symptom of bad governance. And bad governance is a little bit technocratic of, I would say, the bad functioning of democracy even though we have been a democracy for many years, but there's a lot of clientelism, as you said, uh, corruption uh, in the relation between citizens and the civil service. Uh, and um, this was something which uh, was exacerbated uh, in the previous government. So we have, we have said that if we didn't, if we didn't have, we didn't have, we hadn't faced the massive crisis right now to have to cut wages and pensions and so on, um, which obviously was painful politically and had a political cost, we would have gone straight to the, to the root of the problem, which we're doing now, of course, at the same time. We are, uh, we are just the fact that we put everything online was just a, that simple fact. Everything, every euro now is online. So we have the bloggers having a great time because, you know, from uh, the uh, you know, <coughs> napkins that are being bought to the pens in the, in the, in the uh, ministries, you know, they say, why so many pens? Why so many? So anyway, this, is, this, but this just shows the transparency we're bringing to, to our country. Uh, it's taking time. Uh, the tax evasion, we changed, we changed the tax system. But at the same time, during a recession, it's not that easy to raise taxes, change the system, and ask people to, uh, to actually also pay even more, uh, which we actually, actually are doing. We are, we, are, we, are, we are doing better, even though we haven't reached the targets of what we want. But this is a, this is a long-term process. But there are many things we're changing, in fact, and that's, I agree with you very much. Governance, transparent governments, democratic governments is, is the issue. It's not a Greek problem only, just one more point. Mm -hmm. Think of where the financial crisis began. It began with fraud. The so-called uh, complex or SPVs and, and bonds and, uh, and so on were sold as triple A. These were sold as triple A. And why? Because, of course, you had huge lobbies, you had huge uh, uh, biz business interests that could capture the democratic system, could capture democratic processes and so on. So I think the question of governance in a time of concentration of power and wealth, the question of democratic governments is key. And it will be very frustrating for the youth and for our citizens if they don't see uh, real change and fairness in this issue. Okay, Athens is not going to be rebuilt in a day. Boris? The, the situation in the, on the Western Balkans in that respect is uh, maybe a little bit different because we have to, to, to broke the connections between, uh, I mean, what we are doing. This is a broken connections between uh, war criminals, tycoons that are generating organized crime, and uh, pure criminals. <laughs> and uh, that is exactly what we are doing right now. I mean, we are achieving a lot in terms of fighting organized crime by bringing uh, uh, 
very solid multinational companies in Serbia, we are doing even more. For example, Telenor is uh, creating great job in Serbia. Very transparent company. And with that kind of companies that are investing in Serbia, we are creating totally different atmosphere, business atmosphere. And at the same time, we are investing very much in, a, in a regulatory bodies. This is new era of Serbia, and uh, they have a real credibility. And as a president of the country, I'm working with them from time to time, not to make influence on, on their work, but to support them, their credibility and independence. And the key issue is the reform of the judiciary sector. I hope <coughs> in, a, in the middle of this year, we'll uh, reach new standards in the judiciary sector. But few things to explain better uh, situation we were facing with. We had a real improvement in a fight in organized crime in the past two and a half years, but we didn't have a judiciary sector that has been capable to deliver results. We arrested criminals, but we were waiting better judiciary sector to make sentence to them. And right now, situation is much better. Big cats among the criminals are in the jail, 15, 20 years, I hope 40 years. And uh, that is going to create better conditions for investors and uh, improving society. Okay, right, I'm gonna to go to this gentleman there, um, and then uh, to that lady there. Sorry, I didn't realize the microphone was already there. Um, uh, to you, and then into the front again. Yeah, uh, Marcello Palazzi, Progressive Foundation in the Netherlands. I've been working for 20 years on what I call progressive economy. And I have an overall comment, uh, two things. The first is, I think Europe is facing a global challenge, which of course we haven't seen in the past. So we are in a very different situation now with China, India, Brazil. And I fear that we're not open enough to learn from you know, South Korea, uh, China. So I fear there is a bit of a Eurocent Eurocentrism, but not open enough to learn from these countries how best to develop the economy we need in the future. So I think we need to be a bit more innovative. As much as I think that, for example, what you said, Mr. Papandreou, about the new model of growth is absolutely correct, you know, the green industries, industries of the future, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a wider issue behind this is that I, I you know, started 20 years ago working with SMEs. And I have found that the parties of the center left have not been very near this word of entrepreneurship, the word of you know, 20 years ago was SMEs, now it is uh, more responsible leaders, it's sustainable companies, and there are many out there working in the progressive economy which would like to be more connected with the center left parties. So it's sort of an appeal to you to become, and this is where often we put everything into the same uh, uh, we see everything with, with one eye. So the market economy is still working. What is not working has been uh, the financial sector and the regulation that is needed there. There are a lot of progressive business leaders out there, and many of them do not, can't connect with the center left party. So it's an appeal for you to be more closely working with the progressive actors out there in the world. Okay. I'm going to take that point and extend it, and then in a moment put it to Pascal Lamy. Um, because I want to just touch uh, on the multilateral trade talks before we close this uh, panel. Let me go to that lady there. Hi, my name's Rupa Huck. I'm a sociologist at Kingston University in London, not in Jamaica, sadly. Um, I think we've had some very persuasive uh, proposals over the last two days of how to win the economic argument of the downturn. But I think because of the way the session titles have been framed, we haven't I think sort of questions of culture have been largely absent, and surely they would be part of a post-crisis agenda for the centre-left. So I just wondered how we, I mean, we've heard bits about family policy and um, migration, but I just wondered how we sort of change political cultures to make the centre-left more palatable to European electorates. How do you persuade people that green politics aren't just a luxury in a downturn? Um, the last big policy network I was at in Berlin, the big meeting, I think a lot of people here were there as well. The title was actually, it's not just the economy stupid, it's culture too. And it sounds good in practice, but how do you operationalize all of that? Okay, we can come back to that. I'm gonna come down to the front now to this man here. 
Thank you. My name is uh, Dan Jorgensen. I'm the leader of the Danish Social Democrats in the European Parliament and also vice chairman in the Environment Committee. And I would also like to ask about green growth. Uh, connected to this is, of course, the United Nations process of fighting climate change. Unfortunately, that process is not going very well, even though Norway has set a, a great example in leadership and Papandreou is also fighting internally in the EU. Uh, what exactly do we do to get the process back on track? That's one question. And the second question is, how do we make sure that the transformation into a low carbon economy in Europe is a just transition? How do we make sure that the people, blue collar worker, working right now in an old fashioned industry, also see this transition as a good transition? Because even though I certainly agree with most of you that at an aggregate level, we will get more jobs in a green economy than in an old fashioned economy, but for the person working in a coal mine today, that might not be very easy to see. So how do we do this on a practical level? Thank you. Thank you very much. And there was just a gentleman there behind you. Yes, my name is uh, Frank van der Broeke, a member of the Belgian Senate. Um, I'm working with a number of friends on the idea of a European-wide social investment pact. It's kind of inspired by the discussions there have been about it competitiveness pact, the Euro pact plus, etc. And so the question is, how could we make such an idea to have an EU-wide social investment pact, how could we make that operational and how could that mean something in the kind of political discussions we will have over the next few weeks and months, which I think will be quite critical. Um, the question I have is, is both about substance but also about uh, the politics of it. I think we need a message that could both be interesting for, say, Mr. Papandreou and our Greek friends, and interesting for our Spanish friends, but also interesting for Dutch Social Democrats, Belgian Social Democrats, who are in very different situations. Uh, we cannot say we don't want austerity, because we are practicing it in a number of countries. We can also not simply say we should boost overall social investment because I guess you don't have all the money to do that. And so the question is how can we formulate something that is both uh, kind of mobilizing, that adds something that is really useful to the current discussions on economic governance in the European Parliament and in the Council, because I think we should urgently add something to that. And how should that resonate? Um, I think Joseph Papandreou went some way in saying, for instance, well, we, we need a more thorough discussion on funding and so-called euro bonds. It goes some way. Um, an, an, an idea that could go a bit further is that we could say, well, we want to put pressure on every member state to pursue social investment, to carry on in that way, and we want to help countries and member states that pursue that way in different circumstances. This is a kind of reciprocity we need. I'll stop there. So my question is how our Irish friends, our Greek friends, how they feel about this, what kind of wording they need so that it also sounds realistic for them. Okay, I'm going to invite all members of the panel to respond to these last points. Is there anyone, w because um, uh, Prime Minister Zapatero completely understandable reasons can't be here. We haven't had a Spanish voice in this uh, session, and I wonder if there's any colleague from Spain. Yeah, let's go just come over here and hear a Spanish voice. Uh, well, hello, morning, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm Carlos Mulas, the director of the Ideas Foundation, which, uh, which is the socialist, uh, the think tank of the Socialist Party, and President Zapatero is also the president of the think tank, so on behalf of, of himself, um, well, uh, apologies for not being able to come. Um, the reason was precisely that he had an urgent meeting with uh, the trade unions and, um, uh, and the uh, business confederation. Um, and my question goes to this, you know, how to involve, uh, this was about wage bargaining, you know, in order to see if, well, there could be an agreement to reduce salaries, to flexi make it more flexible, the wage negotiation, to get the Spanish economy more competitive and sooner. You know? Uh, this is one of the recommendations and also one of the prerequisites uh, imposed by Brussels in a way. So my question is, is uh, 
based on the Norwegian experience, which we heard a lot about that, no? how can we build some sort of confidence between trade unions and the business confederations to try to get to an agreement to see if they can collaborate in, in the fiscal effort and in the reform effort that uh, the different countries, particularly Greece and also Ireland, are, are doing in this respect to, to get out of the crisis. So what is your view on this? Thank you. Okay, I think that's a, a good point. And incidentally, we haven't heard a, a German voice either. But in Germany, I think we would all acknowledge and accept that there has been a very strong partnership and agreement between the trade union movement and successive uh, uh, governments uh, in bringing about quite far-reaching structural, industrial, and economic change uh, in Germany. Um, uh, I, I want to uh, ask members of the panel then to respond to that point, but also to pick up the uh, further final questions that have been uh, put uh, to you. And then I'm just going to come uh, lastly to uh, Pascal. But let, let's start. Uh, Eamon, will you just pick up some of uh, the points that have been put to the panel in these last questions. Well, let me put, uh, let me take up the last one first. Um, we did have, as a country, um, a very formal uh, social partnership arrangement um, between government, uh, trade unions, employers, and indeed uh, wider civic society. And that formal arrangement was one of the casualties of the economic uh, collapse because, in effect, it has ended. Uh, what we have now ended up with is we've ended up with an agreement between trade unions and government in respect of employment and employment conditions in the public sector. Uh, but we don't have a corresponding agreement in the, uh, in the private sector. And I think one of the things that is probably hindering that is the degree to which there is now a relatively low level of trade union penetration uh, among workers. In the, in the private sector, and in particular among the, uh, among the, new, uh, the new industries. But it is, it is an area that we're, uh, that we're working on and, and have a dialogue with the, uh, uh, with the unions. I think we do have to be mindful of the fact, and I think this probably goes through a number of the questions, that if you look at the political profile uh, across Europe, the European Union in, uh, in particular, um, Labour, Social Democratic parties, are only uh, leading governments in a handful of countries and only in government in a number of other countries. So the political profile um, uh, across Europe uh, does not reflect uh, very, very strongly uh, our, uh, our movement. And that, I think, to some extent is reflected in the way, in, in the decisions and the emphasis that there is in, uh, in solutions that are being, uh, being advanced. The one final point that I want to address is the issue of a uh, question which was raised, which is a question that uh, we hear domestically, and that is, you know, well, you know, why doesn't Ireland restructure? Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, we, are, we have committed ourselves to working the, the program that we have agreed with the EU, the EC, uh, ECB, and, uh, and the IMF. We are confident that that will succeed. Uh, we know it is difficult and it is, it is challenging. I suppose the one thing that we would look for at this stage from partners is that uh, additional obstacles not be placed in our way in, uh, in, 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 in doing that. And I think overall, I think in terms of where this movement is, is going, I think that what, again, I come back to the point that what we have to, um, the, the, the issue I think that we have to address and the, if you like, the vision that we have to portray is one about the future. I mean, I've just come out of a general election and the, most, the, the strongest um, image that I have coming out of that election is people, normally people say to you, well, what are you going to do for me? That's not the question that we were being asked this time. The question we were being asked this time is, what are you going to do for our children? Because people, I think, are looking much more ahead. There's a much greater sense of you know, what the future, and there's an uncertainty about it, uncertainty about wh where Europe is uh, competing with the rest of the world. I think that was reflected the, uh, some of the... Uh, uh, questions that are here, uh, people uncertain about where their own futures is going to be in terms of employment, in terms of earnings, in terms of pensions, in terms of social security, and indeed uncertainty about energy and about uh, the, uh, uh, the state of the, the environment. And I think it is that future, I think we have to capture that future and we have to present a vision uh, which is realistic uh, and which um, uh, assures people that we have answers uh, for them in the future. 
Eamon, thank you very much. Boris, can I invite you to offer some short wrap-up comments? I totally agree with you. The, the main issue is, uh, uh, are we capable to deliver something for children of our waters? And the uh, second question is, uh, are they going to understand our intention right now before elections? Uh, if, we want to, if we want to deliver some concrete results, reforms, uh, we have to be capable to defeat our rivals on elections, our populistic rivals and nationalistic rivals on elections. Uh, people are impatient, uh, having in mind uh, how deeply are they are affected because of crisis. And um, the, the worst thing is that we have to be more rational than our rivals. This is not very easy, having in mind the nature of human beings. Uh, the, the energy of irrational uh, part of our personality is uh, much stronger. <laughs> and uh, we have to find a way to explain in these very difficult circumstances. I'm saying this as a psychologist, not as only as a politician, but I know how difficult it is to be rational in politics. <laughs> I don't think we've ever had a politician psychologist qualified uh, on one of these panels before. This is a first and very valuable. Jens, um, your wrap-up comments. Um, yeah, first, a comment on the question of trade unions where, where you refer to Norway. I think that we have great success in Norway with a very close cooperation between the Labour Party and the trade unions and also with the, uh, between the government and the trade unions. And I think that it, 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 it's not possible to understand that, uh, that without uh, uh, to understand it with a, with a historic context because it is a long tradition and we have proven uh, through many years that it is in the mutual interest both of the trade unions and of the government to work uh, closely together. Uh, and I think one reason for that is that in Norway we have uh, quite high degree of uh, unionized workers. Uh, we have... Uh, we have strong national-wide uh, unions, so they are able to take the responsibility not only for very narrow-minded union approach, but for the whole economy. They restrain their wage demands uh, to keep unemployment down. Uh, they are partners in social uh, uh, reforms, like a big pension reform, which is, was very radical, and we did it together with the trade, together with the trade unions. But uh, in return, they, they, they have an economy with low unemployment, with the steady wage increases, and with the overall a good pension system. So as long as we see the mutual interest, uh, there is a potential for working together, but it's not easy to copy uh, into other countries where the traditions are uh, very different. Just then two other short remarks. One is on green economy. In one way, I think we make that much more difficult than it is. It's very easy to promote a green economy, and that is to make the polluter pay. Uh, it, it's, it's straightforward, uh, but we, 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 we sometimes lack the, uh, the boldness or, or the courage to do so. And, uh, and the most opposite, or the, the, mo the most obvious way of doing that is to introduce more of carbon pricing. Carbon pricing has a double positive effect. Uh, it will reduce carbon emissions, and it will generate public revenue. Uh, and then we can solve both the debt crisis and the climate crisis with one uh, tool, <laughs> if we have the courage. Then, of course, the problem is that the more we price carbon, the more is the need for international coordination. And that's uh, also a big challenge to have it uh, on a more broader international uh, scheme. I think that what the European Union do when it comes to emission trading is excellent, and we need more of that. The last. Uh, uh, remark is on the euro and, uh, and, uh, and the problems within the euro. Uh, I should be careful of doing so because uh, in Norway we are experts uh, in applying for membership uh, to the European Union. We are not experts. Uh, yeah, two times. Uh, uh, as I told many of you, uh, we are the only country in the world that has applied for membership and been uh, uh, um, admitted as member, negotiated an accession treaty. Uh, and then voted it down in a referendum, not only once, but twice. So we are really experts in applying. 
Uh, but, but the only remark I have is that the, many of the problems, and I'm sure that Pascal can say more of that later on, that the euro now is facing, they were foreseen. I mean, because it, it, it was obvious that when you introduce that kind of currency union, it will become very cheap to borrow from some countries. So then you had to limit the uh, access or the ability or the of opportunity to borrow. And that was why you introduced 3% deficit and 60% and, and debt, the Maastricht criteria. But then you didn't implement that. So, so you borrowed too much. And then you are back again that progressive policy is to be prudent when it comes to fiscal policy. And then you have to have surplus, you have to have uh, 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 restrict demand, public expenditure during good times. You should not spend that surplus on tax deductions or big public expenditures. You should, you should create uh, the reserves, the surplus you need in, in downturns. Europe didn't do that, and that's one of the reasons both for the debt crisis and the problems with, with the euro. So more discipline is a very social democratic message. Very good, very Norwegian. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we would love to have your common sense, your productivity, and your sovereign wealth uh, in, 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 in the European Union. Anyway, I'm not going to identify those two large members, states of the European Union, uh, who first defied and weakened uh, the Maastricht criteria and fiscal discipline. All I would say is that they are not on the periphery of Europe. Um, George? Well, to take up the theme that uh, Jens uh, mentioned and link it to some of the questions of uh, how can we have a policy which, in a sense, is a, a social democratic policy or a progressive policy and uh, can apply to both the South, which is now having its problems, or the periphery, however you want to call it, uh, and, and also the other countries which are more robust. And I think the word austerity is not the right word. I think the word I would like more is responsibility. And responsibility would mean, as Jens has said, you know, how we, how we manage our macroeconomic situation, how we manage our finances in a responsible way. Uh, but I would add to that, responsibility also would mean for us responsibility to uh, values such as social justice, uh, sense of justice in our societies, which the increasing inequalities in between and also in this globalized society is, 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 is a big threat. I would also add to this a, a question of responsibility to our democracies and uh, the need to replenish, uh, reinvigorate. Uh, you will have talking about the social partners of trade unions, but there are in many countries a lack of uh, participation, of, of, of institutions of participation, and particularly the youth when they're unemployed, they don't really have a place where they can uh, they can sort of put their, lay down their head and, and, their, and their woes. And so the internet, social media, we have to see how we, 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 we find new ways of, of deliberation and, and, and participation in this, uh, in this, both politically but also in the social economy. And uh, one thing we're doing in Greece also is, is looking into the issues of, let's say, uh, the social enterprises and so on and, and, and see how inter entrepreneurship can be uh, part of the social enterprises and part of... Uh, our culture too. Uh, and of course, responsibility to our environments and to that means a green economy, it means the next generation, as Eamon said also, <coughs> this is another responsibility we have and it's a collective one. Uh, and, and I just want to add to this what, what Jens said, the, the CO2 tax has been also one of the issues that we progressives have, have, have pushed forward, uh, we in the Socialist International have pushed forward also. Um, this would bring revenue it is an area of revenue, such as the financial tax, transaction tax also, such as euro bonds in leveraging private funding. Uh, and if we did have a more coordinated policy, for example, in Copenhagen uh, uh, a, a year or so ago, uh, we possibly uh, could have made more of an impact uh, and, uh, and, and then created the environment where more investment would come into, into the green economy. And, and what Jens said, of course, is very right. We, a CO2 tax means more coordination, uh, more global governance, and this is where Europe could play a much, more, much stronger role. That would be able to be a, a, a solution where you say, yes, we do have better, uh, more responsible measures in dealing with our member states 
budgets, but at the same time we have other means where we bring in for growth and changing and transiting our economy to, to, to a much more viable economy, but bringing jobs also. Uh, so I think this is where the progressive, uh, our progressive views can be of, of, of essence. I, I have, living through this, uh, this period and living through the, the, this, this very difficult crisis in Greece, uh, having to, to impose very difficult measures in order to deal with our debt and deficit has not made me less progressive or I would say less socialist. I would say even more so. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, our, our views, our, our policies, the things we're talking about now are more relevant in, in our world and rather than less relevant, even though that may not show up in the polls and in some of the elections. But I think this is where we need to keep on going. And just one final point, um, thanking Jens. Uh, he talked about the two applications. And the second application, I happened to be foreign minister in the presidency of the European Union uh, uh, where we negotiated with the Norwegians. Uh, uh, we were very unhappy that you didn't uh, make it into the European Union, but I did get something. I got a book with all the fish of the Northern <laughs> Sea, so thank you very much. Well, small compensations. Um, anyway, uh, I, I was actually trying to see a, find a German face, but have failed, but I think our German colleagues will take back home uh, the remarks you made about the need for a euro bond. Now, just lastly, in the final two minutes we have, a lot of the questions and the contributions that have been made uh, on this panel have taken up the theme uh, of the need to manage globalization intelligently, uh, in a progressive uh, and fair way, and in a collaborative and cooperative way. Uh, I can think of no better illustration, both of the need for that and the difficulties in doing so uh, than the World Trade Round, uh, the uh, Doha Development uh, Round. Um, recently, the former US trade representative wrote in Foreign Affairs that in her view, the trade round uh, was dead, should be jettisoned and buried, and we should move on without, I must say, making very clear where we were going to move on to and how. Pascal, um, can, can you just give us the final word uh, on this? Because for the sake of the whole multilateral tra system, not just the trade system, the rules-based trade system in the world, but for the whole cause of multilateralism in which we believe, uh, to see the trade round possibly foundering in this way uh, is a huge potential uh, setback. Karen, I don't know whether you might want to comment also, but um, Pascal, have the last word on this. Well, I mean, your, your starting point, Peter, is uh, absolutely correct. This uh, WTO system, this multilateral trading system, is the only real working system of multilateral economic governance. And uh, the fact that we cannot uh, conclude this uh, one of the functions of the system, which is to update its rules regularly uh, is, uh, is clearly uh, a very uh, disheartening uh, and uh, in a way dangerous signal for multilateralism at large. Uh, the reality is fairly simple. Uh, the updating of this rule book, uh, which uh, members of WTO have been working on for 10 years, and you yourself, uh, Peter, brought uh, your own stone to what has been built during 10 years is potentially there, but for a uh, stalemate uh, on uh, a few uh, industrial tariff line tariff reductions uh, between basically uh, US on the one side and uh, China, India, Brazil on the other side. So this small thing blocks the whole deal. Uh, and it's a typical case where, you know, short-sightedness, uh, domestic politics being uh, captured by a few vested interests, uh, prevent the improvement, reinforcement of a huge uh, public good. That's the fundamental reality. And it has to do, in my view, 
at least partly, I wouldn't put the whole explanation on this, and by the way, I should be very careful about giving a whole explanation of this, which probably would uh, not please uh, many people, or at least many of the WTO members, and I obviously shouldn't do that. Uh, but one of the reasons behind this is in the US uh, domestic politics, and one of the reasons in the US domestic politics is uh, the hostility of US trade unions to trade opening. Now, why is the IFL-CIO hostile to trade opening? The fundamental reason is that uh, in the US, uh, unionization is easier in the old economy than in the new economy. So if I'm the leader of the uh, AFL-CIO, an open, active trade policy will automatically erode my membership. I'll be sowing the branch on which I'm sitting every day. Unlike Germany, for instance, where 10 years ago, trade unions had a big debate within themselves and you know, Verdi, which is the German trade union for services, is now sort of more influential than IG Metall as it was 10 or 20 years ago. Why? Because they've, they've identified this issue. So at the end of the day, it's, it's a big multilateral problem. It's a big risk for a system that notably during the crisis has you know, allowed to contain very efficiently uh, inevitable protectionist uh, tensions or pulsions here and there. But as we all know, this is all about domestic politics. And there is a big issue and there is a you know, big question for, for sort of progressives who have been working on an open trade agenda, both for domestic reasons and for caring about uh, uh, development at large, this sort of issue is in reality what blocks the conclusion of this negotiation, and it is about domestic politics, and this is where the solution lies. One sentence. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to have to say anything else except that I found the panel extremely inspiring, but because my dear friend Pascal has been the creator of the Doha round on the AFL, I just think I have to say, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. And um, I think one of the things that progressives have to uh, spend a lot of time thinking about is um, how we make the mul this multilateral system work, but also how we deal with some of the dislocations of trade in a way that builds trust. Uh, uh, among all people. Karen, thank you very much indeed. And that f folds um, neatly and nicely into uh, the next panel, which is going to take up international uh, themes. I doubt very much, uh, frankly, whether Pascal would disagree with that last sentence you expressed. I think it reflects very strongly his own uh, uh, perspective. <laughs> thank you all very much indeed for your candor for your experience, but above all, uh, for your leadership uh, on this panel. Um, uh, we will have, uh, uh, sort of what, a two-minute refreshment break, Olaf? Or one minute, I don't know. Or are we not going to have a break at all? Um, um, uh, but thank you very much indeed uh, for your participation, and thank you all those guys up here. Thank you. Thank you.